Okay, so has anyone continued on with the uh, with the lab, with the bomb lab? How far have you been able to get so far? Oh, you already finished it? Oh, fantastic. Excellent. Well, I actually, I would be very happy for those of some of you who have been able to get through it if we want to be able to have some um, some uh, student presentations on how to do some of these activities, because I think that would make it a lot more interactive in terms of uh, the classroom setting. So yeah, like, let me know which one, if, if you want to do a demonstration, let me know which phase you would prefer to do a demonstration for. Don't feel compelled that you have to, but I think that may bring a little bit more like funness to the class. Excellent, excellent. Well, in today's uh, lecture, I want to go over phase two, but not just phase two, I want to show an alternate way to do phase one as well. So we learned how to use phase one for strings. Did anyone else, has anyone else made any progress in this lab? At the server room, just making that sound. Okay, so so we saw how we could do uh, how we use the strings command line utility last time to solve our phase one bomb. Uh, in today's lecture, we're going to learn how to do phase two. But before we do that, I want to show you how to use the debugger as well to be able to solve that same problem. So we're gonna look at two alternate ways to do our first phase before we dip our toe into the second phase. So, okay, let's see here. Uh, I'm gonna start right inside of my web terminal. I'm already logged into the terminal here. So we haven't used the debugger a whole lot. We use the strings utility. I think we touched the debugger very slightly last lecture. So when we go to use our debugger, we will invoke it GDB and we're going to pass it the executable file that we want to go ahead and we want to go ahead and debug upon. So this is going to be bomb and it's going to go ahead and launch our debugger for us. So there's a couple of things and I have, um, when I show these slides, I'll have a cheat sheet for you for being able to use the debugger. But one of the nice things about our debugger is we can set certain breakpoints. A breakpoint means that when it hits that code block, it'll stop and allow us to kind of be able to interact at that phase in our software. So there are certain, when we look at our uh, source code, remember there was a function in particular that we probably don't ever want to get invoked. That's our explode bomb function. So we can always set a breakpoint so that if the explode bomb function were to get invoked, we can prevent it from happening. Let's see how that actually works. So let's do break. And what we'll do here is um, explode bomb. And you'll see that's gonna set a breakpoint in the debugger at the address where that function is declared at. And it's just, just to illustrate how this works, well, suppose that I did something goofy and I did a typo, right? So suppose I did, um, break, and then I did, uh, there we go, we lost the P there. You'll see that if there's not the label or identifier there, it's going to show that there's nothing defined inside your application with, with that identifier. Okay, so um, we're going to do, uh, well, right now we'll just do the one, the, the one break just to see and explore how this works. So we're going to break on explode bomb. And so now if I want to actually run the application from within the debugger, I can just type in run. Now, I'm not going to use the text file because we're just going to play around with seeing what happens when we set that breakpoint. So I'm going to run this here. And so we see that our application executes the way that we saw how it executed uh, last lecture when we were kind of investigating this lab. So here, just as a proof of concept, I'm going to create a string that's clearly not the answer, right? Like we already know the string for my particular bomb is not hello world. But if I go ahead and hit enter, you'll see it then launches my debuggers environment. And there's a lot of data that you can see inside of here. And it's very well kind of articulated. 
you'll see where we are in terms of our stack space at the very top. You see the line that's actually green and the one that is highlighted is where we're currently at. So of course, the breakpoint for our application was it stopped before exploding the bomb. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, you can see right here what's on effectively our activation stack. So it's our main method from our main method. Phase one got called from phase one. The explode bomb got called. Okay, I think, and at this point, when you see that you're an explode bomb, a good thing for you to do at this point would be to hit the Q. To go ahead and just quit the application and uh, prevent it from exploding. That way you don't lose any points. So this is one illustration of how we can use the breakpoint to protect ourselves from accidentally exploding the bomb. In fact, as you continually go through these uh, the phases inside this lab, you're probably gonna wanna poke and prod at what causes the bomb to explode so you can kind of investigate what's happening across the state of the application. So you can kind of reverse engineer what values you have to provide in terms of the string to diffuse the bomb. Okay, now I said, before we start investigating phase two, we're gonna look at an alternate way using the actual debugger tool, not the strings utility to, uh, to solve this problem. So let me go ahead and uh, clear out of this and let's relaunch. So I'm gonna relaunch my debugger on side of our bomb application. Oh, and I don't have my, because I'm inside the web terminal, I don't have the uh, the chat open. So if, if anyone is logged into the Zoom and looking at the chat and if someone asks questions, please in-class people alert me to that. Because <laughs> otherwise I have to, okay. So first thing I'm gonna do then is when I launch my debugger, I'm going to make a break for explode bomb. And then I'm also going to, in this instance, going to make a break for phase one so that we stop as soon as we launch into phase one. Okay, so now I have two breakpoints. One, to catch the instance before my bomb explodes, and the second to catch the instance when I launch into the particular phase I'm interested in solving. Okay, so uh, I'm going now run my application. Now that I've set the breakpoints that I'm interested in, we're gonna launch and we have the prompt. So what I can do here is I'm gonna put in just a some garbage text. I'm gonna hit enter. Okay, so just like before, when we set the breakpoint to explode, now we set the breakpoint to phase one. So the moment we enter into phase one, we get the ability to start interacting inside this environment and see how the state of our application changes instruction by instruction. So we start inside of, so let's see here. Why don't we just kind of step through and see what happens? There's all There's a couple of different commands that could be interesting, but just looking at the surface here, um, Let's see, we're gonna move. This looks like a very interesting command here. Moving into our ESI is likely gonna probably be the string that we're interested in. And in fact, we're gonna be calling this function strings not equal. So let's see, let's just see what happens. Like we're gonna catch the bomb regardless. So let's just have it advance to the next instruction. So if I want to advance to the next instruction, I can just type in next I. And so it's going to go ahead and move down. Okay, let's do this again. Next I and see what happens. See what's highlighted green has shifted. We're going to let it execute the next instruction. Ah, now we're starting to get... So we have after the invocation of that function call, right, of uh, not equals or string not, strings not equal, it's actually reporting to us that in RDI, we have what I passed in, right, hello world. And we can see inside of RSI is 
a string that it's actually doing the comparison for. And in fact, if I want to read from memory what's inside of RSI, I can do X slash, and then I can define what type of like the volume of memory I want to read, the register I want to read from. Here, I'm going to do S, and then I'm going to go and do uh, RSI. And that's going to print out from memory the string that it's actually doing the comparison on. So if I wanted to solve phase one using the debugger as opposed to the strings utility, I now have the actual string that's being evaluated to my hello world uh, garbage one I put in. And now if I continually do next I, or if I just type in continue until it gets to the next breakpoint, we'll see that I'm now going to be in the explode box. Just to see that, you know, at the result of the comparison, which clearly when the strings aren't equal, is going to lead to an explode bomb event. So now you've seen how to how to solve phase one in two different ways, and you have a little bit more involvement with using the debugger at this very early level. And in fact, we're going to use the debugger for phase two, and we're not going to use the debugger for phase two. We're going to look at two different approaches for phase two as well because it's, it's simple enough where we don't necessarily have to poke and prod and examine the state, but then we also will because that's a lot of the fun of this, this project. And it's just good to see different ways to solve the same kind of lab. Excellent, so does anyone have any questions about that, what I just did? And let me just make sure the online, and I'm thinking, make sure, yeah. Okay, so let's quit out of this. Or I think we already quit, so let's clear out of that. So let's launch this again. Now, last time we did this, I think we got to the point where we use the object dump utility. Isn't that where we last left off? We use the object dump utility to actually be able to get the uh, assembly code. And then I think I tasked the uh, the class to see if you can't you if you can't read through and ascertain what that assembly does. Now I think your your bomb's likely going to be slightly different than mine. So the solution, the numerical sequence you'll have to do is a little bit different, but the concept that's going to drive you to a solution is going to be relatively similar. So let's jump over here. Let's go back to my... Um... Okay, so let's, let's jump to the methodology where we can use object dump for a solution, and then we'll see how we can do the same thing using the debugger. So we did this last time. I should have my bomb.s. What I did was I used the object dump utility to go ahead and um, disassemble my bomb application. And then I redirected the outputs instead of going to standard out, that would just display inside of my console. I could then have it author or redirect to a text file so that I can then use a text editor to search or find or whatever I want to do inside of there. And so when we stated that we were going to take a look at the output of object dump, we said that it had effectively three different columns, a column that's going to be an address, a column that's going to be our machine code and the column that's going to be the assembly code, which is what we're concerned about because that's what is going to allow us to go ahead and kind of read and create our own comments. So let's start. So this was this was what we have, right? If I go back to my let's see, yeah. So if I just take a quick look at my bomb.s, right? This, we were able to go ahead and see all of the, the 
uh, disassemble code, but then we could go ahead and search a pattern on it where we look for where phase two is defined at and recall that phase two is the function name for the phase that we're actually interested in. And so what we'd actually see is a label called phase two that would then have a series of addresses, a series of the um, of our uh, machine code, the hexadecimal representation, and then finally our assembly code. Okay, so now the next question is, how can we read this assembly code to try to predict what it is we need to provide as our string to diffuse the bomb for phase two? And so we're going to step through this a little bit at a time. You'll see I have on the slide itself provided line by line comments. And then I've also supplied some, some red text. We're going to jump back to this. Let's take and motivate some concepts before we look at how to read or what parts of our uh, assembly code we're going to read through to try to find those hints. So. The first thing we should highlight and just make sure that everyone's familiar with is that when we start examining functions at the assembly level, there's going to be a certain amount of boilerplate that has to happen before we even start executing the instructions inside of that function. So it's important to know what are the boilerplate instructions and what are the instructions that are specific to that function in and of itself? So we'll think of the function as having a body, but then you have a little bit of prologue, right? A little bit of setup stuff. And then you have a little bit of teardown stuff. You have a little bit of a epilogue that happens between your function. So what we're seeing here, for, for instance, is the moment our function phase two gets called, we're pushing data uh, to save for our uh, base pointer and our, BB, uh, our BX register for the callee saved registers. Like remember that we had stated when we we're going through chapter three, there's a couple of um, data values that the callee function might want to preserve. So our function will push that off and then it's gonna, it's going to, uh, return those values back. It's gonna restore those when our function is done. So you'll see the very first two calls are simply to, to maintain data values so they don't get lost. And the very last two right before we return is to pop those back off and restore those back to the registers. So the calling function has access to the data that it originally had before it gave control to this function. So those aren't going to be part of their, our solution, right? We can ignore those. And that's all preamble stuff. What else is preamble? We also have right here where we're going to go ahead and do a subtraction by some amount on our RSP pointer, right? Our, our stack pointer. And then we're going to move our operation. So this is effectively just allocating some amount of space for local variables that we might need access to in our saved in, inside of our saved register space. And just like we're allocating storage on our stack before we ever, we ever start uh, um, performing the actual procedure we care about, when we're done, we're going to deallocate. So the entire point of this is when you look at this, you'll start to look at patterns that's consistent across your assembly code for when you enter into a function. And so it's important to be able to just to know, okay, this is the boilerplate stuff versus this is gonna be the more meaningful stuff. Okay, so with that said, let's jump, um, let's jump into the function that we had disassembled. And we'll, we'll get back to this one. This one's an interesting function. I, I included it. We have to access it from the debugger, but we'll see how we can step into functions on the debugger to kind of see other ways that these bombs can get triggered so we could see all of the cases. But uh, but this is, uh, this when we start using the debugger for this part of the solution, we'll take a look at this. Okay, so just analyzing this, why don't we start labeling 
the parts that might be interesting versus the parts that are, you know, just it's the, uh, the, the normal fluff. So we said these parts here were all the preamble. And then we have these parts here inside of our source code. That's all of the teardown. So then once we get through to actually start doing things inside of here, this is where it gets interesting, right on this line here. Notice we're instantly calling a function called read six numbers. Well, to me, that's a clue for the type of input that's being expected for this particular phase. A function clearly is letting us know how many tokens, at least, our entry is going to have to be. So we should keep that in mind. Read six numbers. And we can test this out, too, in the, in the debugger. Later on, we'll be more exploratory and less analytical, where we can just start throwing things into our uh, phase and see what results from that. OK, let's see. What else are some other interesting things in here? Uh, we have a couple of jumps. Whenever I say you see uh, these jumps to different addresses, I highlighted them in blue to see how we move around inside this code base. So let's see. We have. So here we're going to. So th So some clues for input. These are going to be some more. So whenever we do a jump right here, let's look for the compares. In this instance, we're doing a compare here between these two values, EAX and what's being effectively dereferenced at this location. And we can see that there's a jump if those are equal. So if those are equal, we're jumping to 401099. That's going to be here, right? So what's the thing we're jumping past if EAX and this dereferencing operation is equal? We're jumping past this line right here, this call to explode the bomb. So now we know that's got to be a condition. There's some condition that's being evaluated. And based off of equality, if they are equal, then we don't blow the bomb up. Okay, let's see. What are some other things? So this, to me, is another clue of what our input is going to be. So we're evaluating six numbers so far, right? And the numbers have to be equal to some value that we are uh, that, that that's generated inside the source code. Okay, let's see, what are some other clues? Are there any other clues for input? So we know that this here is the comparison. This provides the jump. This gives us a function name here on being able to read X amount of numbers. Uh, some other things we see here is another jump, right? And another comparison. We're having a comparison to RBX to the value of five. And so here, we, if it's not equal, we're going to jump to this address here, which is going to be here. So to me, we have a looping structure, which makes sense because we have six digits. And if we're checking to see if the value is five, then we're probably looping from zero to five and doing this comparison a total of six times. So what that tells me is that we're gonna have six numbers that have to be in a particular order in this in this comparison in, in inside of um inside of um this application. So okay. Is everyone with me up to this point? So from the lines that I've highlighted that I think are interesting. Does everyone see kind of how those were clues if we're doing an analytical decomposition of this source code? Okay. So then the next thing is, why don't we try to take the assembly code and map it into something that looks like C code? Why don't we see if we can't reverse engineer so that we can't 
So instead of having to think of this as a per instruction basis, we can kind of abstract it into seeing what the conceptual basis is. So we're gonna walk through the actual lines of code. I'm gonna comment them out and I'm gonna give you a C code equivalent that we can build into an application that's gonna generate using a, uh, a looping structure, six different numbers. Okay, so as I said earlier, the very first lines of code, I'm, I'm gonna include it all, but I'm gonna highlight where it fits into my C code motif. So the first several lines, I can just comment out because that's my preamble stuff, right? That's, that's the maintenance for making sure that the registers are, uh, save the values for the call leave function. So when we return control, we haven't mutated the state from a function when it expects to still have the values that it started with. Okay. So then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna call this read six numbers function, which is not a function that's inside of our C code, but we can see what happens once we start using the debugger with it. I will say that this function itself, the read six numbers, can cause the bomb to explode. You don't have six numbers. We'll, and, and, and we'll play around with that. Uh, but that's on the uh, on a different phase. When we do approach two, we'll we'll play around with that. Okay. So anyway, all of this isn't really part of our phase two, right? Or not part of the our ability to effectively generate a logic that's going to create that looping structure that's going to generate numbers for us, and then do an analysis of the number it generates versus what we supply as input. So we noticed that there seemed to be a loop inside of the assembly code and it went up to five. So it starts at zero and we'll keep the, the register that's actually used as the loop counter as the same. So the variables are gonna match to the registers that are maintaining the state so that we can try to match the logic as closely as possible. So here we're going to set our uh, RBX to zero. And so long as RBX is less than or equal to five, we're going to increment it. We're going to continue to loop until that condition breaks. So how do we know that's the case? Well, here is the instruction where we're, move, we're initially moving it to EBX, the value of zero, right? And then here inside of this line, we can see, oh, we're going to compare to see if RBX is five. That's our loop control variable. And if it's not equal to five, because we're gonna increment it at each step, when, so long as it's not equal, we're gonna do a jump that's going to re-enter the loop body and repeat the process. Okay. Then I'm going to go ahead and assign to EAX into my accumulator register the value of whatever RBX is currently plus one. So I'm gonna increment RBX and assign that, well, not increment it, I'm adding one to it. Increment implies I'm mutating RPX, RBX. I'm, I'm not mutating it at this particular state. So I will add one to it and then I will overwrite my accumulator. How do I know that's what I do? because this is what's happening here, load effective uh, address. And here we're dereferencing the value of RBX and we're gonna perform an increment of one on there and that's gonna get loaded into EAX. X, oh, you're talking about, yeah, here, yes. <laughs> uh, little typo, very good catch on that, for sure. Because then otherwise, we're not gonna jump for the jump not equal to. Yeah, very good. Um, So here, we're gonna map this instruction such that we update our value of EAX, 
based off of whatever the current value of RBX, which is our loop control variable, and we're going to add one to it. Then we're going to look at this instruction here, which is going to add to EAX the value that's held at this base pointer and our offset of RBX, which is our loop control variable, and our integers are four bytes, right? So the size of our um, bit sequences is gonna be uh, four bytes. So this will allow us to go ahead and do a, effectively a dereference inside of our array based off of what the index value is into RBX. And notice, since we have that inside of parentheses, we'll effectively be dereferencing that so that we can add that to whatever the current value of EAX already is. And the result gets redeposited back into the accumulator register, right? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a comparison. We're gonna compare to see if EAX is equal to the, okay, we're gonna look at this base pointer again. So we're gonna access that array at the index of RBX, but we're gonna offset it by one byte, I mean, uh, uh, by four bytes. So we're actually gonna grab the element that's after the current element we're looking at. See, so where this is a dereference of the element currently RBX, this would be a dereference of the element at RBX plus one. And so now I'm going to compare that to my accumulator. And I'm going to see if it's equal. If it's equal, I jump. which means if, they, uh, if they're not equal, then I'm gonna explode the bomb. And again, this is that comp, or that's, that's that intuition we saw earlier where we're comparing EAX towards that, uh, that dereference into the array of uh, values that we had. And then the final lines of code are all my cleanup and return stuff, right? So it's not really part of this logic. So does does this mapping, has this mapping kind of helped people understand how to kind of parse the assembly and think of it in maybe a, a higher level? And let, let me do this. Maybe this will help too. If I now remove the clutter, which is the assembly, this is effectively our logic then, right? So given our RBX, value, which we start at zero, and so long as it is less than five, I will increment it. And then inside of the body of that loop, I'll take the value of RBX. I'm going to add one to it and assign that to EAX. So then EAX, I will then add to it the value inside of the array. The array that we've been talking about the entire time is the six integer values that gets passed as the string for this phase. Then once I've mutated EAX, I'll check to see if EAX is not equal to the, uh, the next element in the array. Then we explode the bomb. So that gives us a sequence. Now that we have defined a sequence, we can now reverse engineer what the values are given what RBX is. So we can say, in my particular case, if RBX is zero and I index into my array at index zero and then add one to it, then that's going to have to then equal 
the value in array at index value one. And again, since my RBX can be any value, it will be a value at zero, at one, at two, at three, and four, we can start doing just some basic uh, algebra to see that given my first equation of starting with a simple positive number of one, I can then resolve to derive the value of two. And four and seven and 11 and finally 16. So based off of this computation, the six digit set of values I'll have is one, two, four, seven, 11, and 16. And again, the values you see here are based off of the summation of my RBX value and the value that's held in the array that I originally get. Does anyone have any questions about this? Okay, this is just one way to do, this is the analytical way where you take a look at the assembly code and either through the assembly code, you look for a pattern that you could then backfill the numbers. Oh, and we, we can test this out as well. I guess let, let's actually prove that this, uh, this works. Okay, so I will um, I will do this still in, inside the debugger so I can set a breakpoint. But you know what? No, I'll just run it. Do you want to do that? Do you want? Let's see. Um, let's see here. I guess we'll live dangerously. We're just gonna we're just gonna execute. Uh, let's see here. Uh. Okay, so I still have my psol.txt from last class. So I automatically get past my uh, first phase. So my phase one is the fuse. How about the next one? So what was that pattern I said it was? It was one, it was two, it was four, it was seven, it was 11, was it 16? Was that right? Well, ah. That was indeed correct. Um, of course, the much safer way to, to test that out, that's not how you want to test it out. The safer way to test that out would have been to launch GDB, give it the bomb, always set your breakpoint, uh, explode, bomb, Okay, and, well, I guess now it doesn't matter. Um, well, now that we're in GDB, I'm gonna show you how to solve it with GDB, but we're still gonna test it out the same way. So then when I run inside of here, if I wanna give it the uh, command line argument, I do that with the run command. So here, that'll launch me to here with phase one. And here, if I go and like accidentally type the wrong number in, I won't accidentally explode myself, right? It'll bring me to the breakpoint where it says, oh, you're in the explode bomb function now. Didn't call it, we're there, haven't executed it. So didn't lose any points. Always a safer way. Even if you're confident that you have the answer, you might typo it. Okay. So quit out of here, let me clear my console. Let's solve that same problem, but just using the debugger. So the way we did it before took a lot of like, it took a lot of work to kind of compute. And it's always, that's just gonna be the case with these problems. But there's a way that you can kind of mutate and play around with the state and look at what's in the registers and kind of get an intuition of what's happening without being so hardened analytically. So let's see how we could do that. So uh, GDB, uh, let's do bomb again. Okay, let us um, 
set our break for our uh, explode bomb. Perfect. And actually, let's do this too. Moving forward, let's set our break point for phase two. So as soon as we launch into phase two, now, we know what the answer is because we did a analytical decomposition. So I wanted you to know what the answer was so that when you see, if we now pretend like we don't know what the answer is, we can see how we kind of explore to see what the parameters are by using our debugger. Okay, so you're in on the secret of what the real answer is, but let's see how we could have gotten there by just kind of exploring what we have available. So we have what our phase two, we have our uh, explode bomb. So now let's run. Uh, let's run our uh, with our. There we go. Okay, so we're going to start here. So if this is my first go round, and I hadn't done any of the disassembly with my uh, with dumping my object. I might start with what I did last time. I might give it some kind of garbage input to see what happens. So I'm gonna start with that. I'm gonna pretend I've never seen this problem before. This is my first entry into phase two. So we'll do hello world. And I'm gonna hit enter. And we can see very instantly that we haven't exploded any bombs yet because we put a breakpoint at phase two. So now we can walk through phase two to see what happens when I first pass this data in. Okay, so let's see. Uh, so if I wanna move to the next instruction, I'm just gonna do next I. So we start at our entry point. Let's do this again, next I. Okay, yep, we're still inside of that. So let's do that again. Okay, and now all of a sudden, if this is my first time, actually, let me let me show you something really quick. So right now I'm just hitting next I to advance to each instruction. But if I type in uh, uh, disum, oh, oh. Uh, what what was it? Um, Wait, what was it? Oh, yeah, that's what it was. Okay. If I do disass, I can get the same kind of information I would have grabbed from an object dump, where I can kind of do an introspection and kind of look at things that are interesting. Like, for instance, here when we did our disassembly and we were looking at this, we can kind of see that we were doing the comparisons for our loop here. We can see that we had our, um, this is where we're doing our comparison here, which is gonna be the interesting thing, right? Because clearly when we do this comparison, we could see we are gonna jump if it's equal. And if we don't jump, then we're gonna explode the bomb. That's a big clue to us. Just like looking at this code, we can see, oh, this is the trigger point for this bomb. So we know that this has to equal this. But also we can see this function here, re read six numbers. So I typed in hello world. Clearly, clearly the wrong, uh, I, I can see now that this is going to do read six numbers. Okay, so, um, so we know we're probably already on the wrong track. But that's okay. Let's let's do this. Um, let's see if we can't. Uh, step into. This function here, so we're currently inside of our main function inside of our main function is our phase two function. We're currently at here. Okay, so let me step into. the read six numbers function. And now you can see inside the read the, here you can use this as kind of where we're currently at in our code base. So since this is a function I'm unfamiliar with, I can check to see what are the conditions that might likely explode bombs inside of it. 
Recall that in this application, any function that gets called, whether it's the function, whether it's the phase function, that the current phase function you're in, or a supplemental helper function could potentially blow you up. So again, I could do the same thing here. Um, I can disassemble that and I can see exactly the set of instructions that define what read six numbers are. So even though I don't have the direct source code, I can read the disassemble code and get an idea of what it's going to do. And what is one of the things that happens in here? There is in fact an invocation to be able to explode your bomb. So for instance, if I go and type in uh, continue, which will go ahead and continue to the next breakpoint, we know that I'm gonna eventually lead to this explode bomb. And I got to the explode bomb because if you actually took the time to evaluate what six, um, what read six numbers does is it checks to see if the number of parameters you pass in is six. If it's less or if it's more, you get blown up. Okay. Let's try this again. Let's keep exploring. So now we've learned, again, if we were approaching this from the concept that we did not look at the disassemble code until just now, we've already learned something. We learned that there is a function that's evaluating will blow a bomb if we don't have at least six numbers. So now we know to start passing six numbers, right? I've added a little bit of information to what I knew uh, beforehand. Uh, so let's, do, let's launch our debugger again. Okay, let's uh, set our breakpoints. Um, explode bomb. And uh, phase two. Perfect. Okay, so now let's run. Okay, so... I don't know what the numbers are yet, right? I just know I need six numbers. So again, we're going from the guys that I'm exploring my space and figuring out what I need to pass along. So here I'm gonna do zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that is six numbers. That's now valid input. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. Okay. Let's do, let's do this. Let's disassemble and let's take a look at when we do the evaluation, because I'm gonna to wanna to create a breakpoint there. So far, I've seen how I can define breakpoints by using labels. But I can use breakpoints. I can define breakpoints based off of addresses as well. So I can go here and say, oh, this, this is interesting. This. I think this is where I need to, I'm actually evaluating compared to an actual value that's going to be inside of the register space. So I'm going to guess one of these values is my value and another one of value is the correct value. Right, one is mine, the other is the right one. So let's see if that prediction's correct because that's that's where we're checking for equality right before we try to explode this bomb. So if it's equal, we jump and we don't explode the bomb. So what I'll do here is I will grab this address of where I do this comparison right here. We'll copy that. And now I'm going to create a breakpoint. And so if I do a memory address, I have to do a uh, asterisk, and then I could do the memory address. And you'll see that now creates a new breakpoint for me. So now if I type in continue, and now continue will now run my code until it hits another breakpoint.
Okay, so now I've hit that breakpoint, and I've hit that breakpoint that is that comparison. So what I can do is I can do info registers. Oh, I should spell that correctly. So info registers will let me see all of my registers. If I just hit enter, it's going to create a lot of noise inside of my debugger. In this instance, I don't necessarily care about all the registers. I really want to see what's in EAX, right? So I'm just going to type in EAX. So I can just get the singular value I care about. So here, the value is one. Do you remember what I typed in as my string? Well, let's see. I'm going to examine memory. Um, I... OK. And let's see if we can't also look up what's inside of our BP plus, oh, plus um, RBX times four, it's the byte size. RBX is the offset. That's our loop control variable. RBP is the starting point inside of our array. And then finally, you have to add it to uh, zero. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Ah, that's right. And so this should allow us to inspect what we supply versus what's supplied inside of the system. And then if I wanted to, without having to discernibly identify a pattern, I can just keep getting a sequence at a time and keep running this. Let, 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 let's test that. Let's see if I can't do that. Okay, so one is the first value because that's what's in, in EAX. So with that logic, let's continue to the next breakpoint. And here I'm just going to keep looking at EAX. It's fun to continue. Oh, oops, I accidentally blew myself up, even with the debugger. Oh, that's what I get for hidden continue when I'm in, when I'm in the explode bomb. OK, uh, let, let's quit out of this. So let, let, let's look at this again. So let's run this. Let's create a break for explode bomb. Let's create a break for phase two. Okay, let us run with our Okay, and now here we know it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's just do one, two, three, four, five, six now and see how far along that gets us. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to disassemble. I'm going to find where we're doing that comparison again. So the address that we're doing the comparison at was right here. So I'm going to grab this address. I'll copy that. I'm going to set a breakpoint for that. Okay. You can tell it to continue until we hit that breakpoint. Okay. I'm going to info registers EAX. So we know one works. We know two works. Let's hit continue. So now we're in the next phase of that loop. The next sequence it's expecting is a four, right? 
And that's, we know the answer, right? We know it's one, we know it's two, we know it's four, we know it's seven, we know it's 11, and we know it's 16. Now I typed in three here, right? So if I hit continue, I gotta be very careful, read the actual prompt because I'm now gonna be in the explode bomb. I'm no longer inside the loop because my three was not a four, but I now know it was a, it's comparing to a four, right? So I can quit out. I can relaunch my debugger. I can go ahead and call break on explode bomb. Call break on uh, phase two. Run my code. Okay, so we know it's one. We know it's two. We know it's four. Don't know what it is after that. So let's just do five, six, seven, right? Six values. Half of them should now be right. Through process of elimination, we'll find out another one if it's not the right sequence. Okay, so again, I can create a breakpoint. Let's just assume that that breakpoint is going to be the same memory address. We'll see how good that this assumption is. Okay. So now what I'll do is I'll tell it to continue. Okay. And now let's start comparing. Um, so the first value didn't blow us up. So it was correct, which allowed us to go to the second iteration of the comparison inside of our loop. So the next value we're printing out at this juncture is going to be the two which is correct. So now let's go to continue and four, which is correct. Okay, let's continue. Ah, it's seven. We typed in five, which means if I continue again, I'm gonna fall into the bomb because they're not equal. But now I've learned another sequence. This is, I don't know which one is more arduous, right? One is having to recode and re- learn the pattern, like build the pattern from reading the code. This is just kind of exploring around your state until you look at and inspect each one of the values, right? So at this point, I got to one, I got to, I got one, I got two, I got four, I got seven. I mean, I can, I'll do it for the last few times just to illustrate that, yeah, this will get us the final solution for phase two. Um. Okay, so if we do that, let's go ahead and quit, not blow the bomb up again. Oh, party in there. Break, uh, explode, bomb, break, phase two. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's run. Okay, at this point, it's one, two, four, seven is what we definitely know. There's only two that we don't know, so we'll just do eight, nine, incremental order. Um, let's do a break on that address again. And here I'll just, I'll do it the way I should. I'll look for where that comparison is at here. I will copy that and set the break. Okay, and then I will continue. And let's check the registers of EAX. Okay, that's two. Yeah. And that's four. And that's seven. And ah, we get 11. Hexadecimal, right? 
Let's translate that. Now that's 11. Okay. We can clearly see by process of elimination, I will eventually get all the value. So I guess to follow up, for those of you who have kind of been following along with the logic I've been doing here, has everyone been able to accomplish their phase two on their bomb lab? So let me go into here. Let me go into my... So I'm gonna, so it was one, two, four, seven, 11, 16 was the, uh, was the combination. So I'm now gonna save that because moving forward, we're now done with phase two. Everyone should have the tools, whether you wanna do it, the analytical approach or whether you wanna use the debugger to kind of like, evaluate the changes of state for your comparison. Uh, but you should, e either approach should get you through that particular phase. So now let's start to preface. Let's start to motivate with like the remaining time we have in this class, what phase three will look like, just like we did with phase two at the end of last class. Okay, so first, let me make sure that my text file will let me uh, move forward. So I'm going to close this out. So uh, let's do this. Let's quit out. Let's clear my terminal. And let's see if I can't just run. Oh, you know what? We're just, we're going to, we're going to live dangerously. Yeah. So now every time I launch my application, it'll get me through phase one, it'll get me through phase two, so that I can now start to examine what's happening at phase three. So let me control C out of here and actually load phase three into the debugger so we can actually start to look at what the source code looks like for this one. So that, because again, I think what'll be beneficial is as long as you get through phase two, you can see how to start to access your disassembled code for phase three, and then you could start reading what's happening with it. Okay, so let's go here, GBD. Uh, uh, let's do BOM. Okay, let's set a breakpoint at this point. So we'll set a breakpoint for explode BOM. We will set a breakpoint for um phase three, so that as soon as we enter into phase three, we will open our debugger. Let's run our code. So I've now I've updated my text file to include the solution for phase two. So every time I launch, I should now get past phase one and phase two. Excellent. Now at this point, again, I start with nothing. I have no idea what input it's looking for. So just like before, on phase one, when I started today with the debugger and on phase two, when I, when I showed you the approach with the debugger, I'll do the same thing. I'm just gonna give it some garbage input just so that we can move on to invoke phase three for it to do its evaluation of my string. So here we'll do that and here we go. We are now in our phase three and here we can look at the disassembled code. And here it's too big for us to actually look. Let me see, maybe I can expand my, we can see that there's a lot of code. There's a, there's a lot of code that's happening here. I see a lot of jumps. And I see a lot of jumps that are going to, yeah, we'll have to, I see an explode bomb here. I see an explode bomb here. And then at any time, what I can do is I can just step through it as well. So I should be able to, like, for instance, I'm currently at this line. I can walk through instruction at the time. I can look at my registers. I can see what's happening until I finally get to the point that leads me to a, uh, a bomb explosion condition. 
So that's one way I can do this, right? I can literally walk through and watch as this and watch as the state changes my application, or I can look at the disassemble code and rebuild into it something that is more C-like in a higher form logic to try to predict what's happening in this particular instance. Now, there's not enough time in today's lecture to really dig our teeth deep into this, but now that we see how to access our phase three code, I'm going to challenge you all to see if you can't read through your source code. And again, all of our bombs should be different. So the solution for mine should be different than yours, right? Like, please verify that your solution for phase two is different. <laughs> good, good. Oh, yours has the same? So I, I think it should be like, it's. I don't know how diverse the randomization is, but it's possible that everyone has a different set of sequences. So my solutions aren't necessarily going to work for like, don't, don't just type in my solutions from class into your bomb because you might blow it up. But what's important is that you understand how to get to the solution using the debugger. Excellent. Does anyone have any questions? Let me jump over here. Ah, so when am I going to upload lectures on YouTube? It will have to happen after tomorrow. I, it was my intention to try to do it before then, but I'm actually, last night was a all-nighter as it was. Uh, I'm doing my general exam for my PhD candidacy tomorrow. So a big stressor is going to be taken off of me after tomorrow. So then I'll go ahead and be able to do what I should have done uh, sooner. Did you get the yeah, these. Yeah, so I had put the earlier version. So I, the slides were up to date all the way up until last Thursday, and you know I, I I you know each day before lecture I put together new slides, and I I like this idea of trying to find different approaches to save these to solve these problems. Uh, I'm interested to hear like were one of these two approaches the way that you solved your phase two, or did you find a, a different approach? So, uh, I actually used Ghidra to help me on the Oh, <laughs> this pair. For this case, I did go through the code to make sure, like, I was following, like, how it, yeah, it went through. But, yeah. Excellent. Like, yeah, Ghidra was how I went through the, like, the later phases are much more complex. Yes. Ghidra helped a lot. For that. Yes. It's going to get, it's going to get, it's going to get a little bit more comp. These are, I think when you look at the grading, right, the first two phases are much less points, at least half the points than the other. So like we're about to ramp up into difficulty, but start by seeing if you can't like evaluate what's happening inside your source code. And again, next class we'll tackle phase three using the debugger and kind of walking through uh, and trying to analyze how we can go ahead and think about this in a way that should provide you with the tools that you can do for your own lab. And I think moving forward, I'm kind of more keen to doing our uh, lectures like this. So I'll probably just use the labs as our, uh, as our uh, vector into the material, and I'll introduce the material that's relevant as we solve through the labs. I, I just think it's more, and then you could read the book on your own time frame, right? Where it's not so boring having me read it like I'm uh, you know, telling you a nursery rhyme or something. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, I will see you all uh, next week. Have a have a good one. And uh, I will post this thought. So I'll post the videos probably uh, Wednesday night because I'll be done by uh, noon. So I can start really focusing on some some other tasks that are not insane. <laughs>